You know, sometimes I forget really important things. And uh, I'll give you a couple examples. Last weekend, I tried to remember how to set up the pool for the kids. It's getting hot, and I uh, totally forgot that the weather turns cold as soon as I get the pool out. (laughs) No, that's not it. I forgot how complicated pools and pumps and all these things, but don't worry. I knew that about myself. So last year, when I took it down, I taped this uh, really important rubber gasket to a piece of cardboard so I'd remember exactly what it is and where it goes. And just to make sure I wouldn't forget, I labeled it in bold permanent marker. It said, I have no idea what that means. Um, (laughs) And I'm going to find out exactly what I forgot. Uh, I'll remember where the, ga- where the gasket goes and why I have an extra hose. Uh, I guess when there's a leak, I, I don't know, because sometimes I forget really important things. Or um, I should not tell you this story. The other day, we um, were getting tacos for lunch, and I, I leave the office, and I get in line at the taco place in town. They have really good tacos in town. And... Uh, they were really busy that day, super long line. The kitchen was really busy, so I put in my order, and I wait, and I wait. And while I'm in line, I got this, man, this really encouraging text message from one of our young, I think it's Rachel Yentema. She's a young adult around here. She's worked with IF and youth group, and she teaches at the preschool. And she, she sent me a really nice text that said, are you doing okay? And I was just, man, standing in line appreciating that someone took the time to see if I'm okay. And uh, I, was, I was thinking it's a complicated year, and I was going to talk about my big problems, like the long taco line. And really, I was like, thank you for thinking of me. And then I looked and read the text again, and uh, it, it was a text from Rachel Young to my, I forgot to mention, my daughter's preschool teacher. Uh, and it was, are you okay? Is someone going to pick up Eliza <laughs> from school today? And... Uh, yeah, that happened. I sometimes forget really important things. Don't look at me like that. I left the tacos, the really good tacos, and left to pick up Eliza, and she's fine. And uh, the worst is, all right, you, you probably know this about me. On Sunday mornings, it takes up every brain cell I have before worship to try and remember like all the service details, and I just... I really don't want you to have to sit there while I try and figure out stuff up here. And uh, sometimes, right before the service, right before I go up on stage, one of you uh, will just try and tell me something really important, like a prayer request or a calendar or something or another. And normally I just say, could you just send me a note? Because I'm going to forget whatever you tell me right now. Don't even say it. Just no matter how important you think it is, I'm going to forget it. Uh, So I get up on stage, and later I read the note, and it's something like, your fly is down. And and that's super helpful later. And it's okay, because I I forget (laughs) important things sometimes, and it's just bad. I don't think I'm the only one, right? Anyone else forget important things? All right, you all could tell stories about not remembering things. Uh, I could pass a microphone and you could all uh, share embarrassing moments, but you probably forgot what you forgot about because we all forget important things. Now, if you remember, we are in a sermon series uh, called, well, the sermon series is on providence, and there is just this amazing, hard-to-grasp teaching in the Bible. The Bible claims that we don't have the whole world in our hands. And it claims that God does. And if you could just remember who it is that made the world, who holds the world, and it's not, it's not you, by the way, if you could remember who you belong to, if you could somehow see what we call providence, it would free you up from anxiety, you'd be less fearful, less stressed, And it would free you from so many of the side effects of having the delusion that we've got more responsibility than we've been given. Now, providence is sort of hard to wrap your head around. So if you're here last week, we talked about one of these just amazing Bible stories 
that show this off in vibrant but slow-paced action. Exodus story, amazing story about how God is in control of everything and even when no one notices all the details, no one, no one in the story saw it, but God was big enough to somehow use something like disappointment and suffering. God used trauma spread out over hundreds of years. And no one could see it in the moments, but God was big enough to be unfolding his plan with just amazing precision, even when it looked like nothing was going according to plan. God, I mean, this is our God. He just showed off who he was and showed people who was really in charge. I'm not going to tell the whole story again, but God didn't just defeat Pharaoh and his army, the reigning superpower of the day. God kept every one of the promises that he had made, like literally hundreds of years before, he made his people fruitful and multiply. And even though in those moments, no one could see what God was doing through all the bad and all the heartache, God, our God is big enough to make good even when you just see bad. It's called providence. God is kind of a big deal. Actually, I do need to apologize one of you gave me a hard time about this, and I deserve it. Uh, I forgot to men- mention sort of a fun trivia fact from the story. I ask if you know this. So in the story of Exodus, does anyone know the name of the prosperous land that God brought his people to? Let, let me back up. So in the, in the end of Genesis, the small Israelite family, they're stressed out. They lacked food. They lacked land. They had no place to go. And uh, they just prayed and prayed and prayed, God, could you give us food and rain and water and all that? And God didn't do any of that. Uh, Instead, they had to go to Egypt for help. And they met uh, Joseph. And you find out it was all sort of God's plan to bring uh, God's people from wandering around to finding a good, safe land for their family to grow. A very providential plan. David Knapp pointed this out. Does anyone know the name of that part of Egypt? No? Goshen, that's right. Yeah, put up the map there. Our town and village was named after that place where God's providence brought the family of Jacob to grow and flourish. That may not help you at all with providence, but it's fun. It'll help you know that. Uh, Anyway, one of the big problems with providence is that when you're in the moment, you can't see providence. You don't know what God's doing. And you may believe that God can bring good things from bad things. God may very well have bigger, longer plans than I can put my head around. But he doesn't tell you what they are. You can't see providence. Sometimes, and lots of people in the story we just told, people don't live long enough to see what God's doing. And, you know, even if you live long enough, we forget our own experience. Like, I'll just ask you, this isn't crazy, how many times do you forget what God's done for you? You put a prayer request in the prayer chain, you pray for it, God could you, and God does it, and you forget about it. This is is us. We forget important things. So God gives us a simple tool to help you with this, a tool to help you navigate things ahead of you that you may not understand. The Bible has a really simple idea that can change your perspective from being foggy to gaining clarity. If you could do this one word can change you, it will change you from being fearful about what God's doing to being trusting in what God's track record is. We're going to talk about it, but here's the big picture. When you can't see providence, folks in Scripture remember. And when you remember what happened in the past, it may very well change the size of the perceived challenges you have in the present. Now, I'm just going to give you a bunch of examples in Scripture. There are hundreds of these, but I'm going to give you a couple. So the first story I'm going to tell is of King David. King David is reigning about 400 years after the Exodus, and it is not going well. I'm not going to tell you his story, but I'll tell you that it's messy, it's broken, it's dysfunctional. If you read the stories, you'll discover how messy and chaotic and how much bad news there is. It is out of control. Personally, David has disappointments 
when you're a king, there's a fuzzy line between personal disappointment and politics, but I mean, his son tried to murder him. That seems rough. One of his best sons, one of his best friends betrayed him and then committed suicide. Like, I can keep going on. King David probably had PTSD and worse because things everywhere he looked were falling apart. And he'd pray, and it didn't seem like God answered, and he'd try and fix things, and it got worse. And he gives his secret to what helps him look forward, and it's in Psalm 105. The thing that helps David when he's going through all this is remembering God's faithfulness in the past. And David actually remembers specifically the Exodus story. And he remembers providence. You can look at the reference later if you want. This is what it sounds like, Psalm 105. If you read it, there's a bunch of verses about God's people in Israel and how rough and how chaotic and how people in the moment didn't have any hope. And then he says, verse 42, David remembered that God remembered his holy promises given to his servant Abraham. And David's like, oh, right. God brought out his people back then with rejoicing, his chosen ones with shouts of joy. Like, remember that? In the Exodus, God brought them the lands, or gave them the lands of nations. They fell heir to what others had toiled for. In other words, the psalmist is going, I am not the first person of faith to have chaos. There were lots and lots of other people who thought God forgot about them, who didn't think God answered their prayers, who got stressed out because it looked like God wasn't answering their prayers. And God, God wasn't stressed out. God wasn't worried. God actually, in the story, see what it says? Changed their, like, God just like, transformed the story. God in his providence, see the language here? He, he took their loss and changed it into shouts of joy. And David just sings this because he goes, you know, I'm, I'm a lot like those folks. They couldn't see what was going on. I can't see what's going on. But God does. And God can make good things out of bad things. The next psalm is very similar. I'm not going to read Psalm 106, but I'll summarize it for you. A lot of it is talking about how messed up things are with a slightly different spin on it. Because sometimes uh, bad things that happen are your own fault. So Psalm 106 verse 6 says, We have sinned even as our ancestors did. Ancestors, of course, were the people who were alive before. So you've got people remembering and the psalmist, so David goes, just like them, we have done wrong. We've acted wickedly, which is an important point. Sometimes all of the dysfunction that makes it hard to imagine how God can fix things is from outside forces out of your control. You get an unexpected cancer diagnosis. Not your fault. There's, I don't know, a global pandemic. You have problems with your job. Lots of times... You and your family go, are victims of things you cannot control. That's not, that's not what this is about. Sometimes the evil that you face is your own fault. And in those moments when you have to live with your regrets, or when parents or bosses or teachers go, oh no, this kid is the worst version of myself, where could they have learned that from? <laughs> right? Uh, it's sort of my fault, or we could talk about how much hurt people hurt people, right? And I think a lot of us in this season are going, I just didn't deal with my own stress well, and now my family gets nervous every time they hear me raise my voice. Sometimes our sin looks like addiction, which hurts so many people, or anger out of control, or neglect or sometimes it's just going, I did not take God seriously, and now my kids, my family seem lost with no foundation. And you get to this place where you just wonder, like, and it seems crazy to say out loud, but you'll get to a place where you wonder, did I mess up God's plan? 
Did God have something better for my family, my career, whatever, and I got in the way? But that's what David's thinking. And you know what helps David in those moments of regret where he's like, did I mess this all up? It could help you too. David remembers. And he says, you know, when, when our ancestors were in Egypt, I mean, they didn't give any thought to your miracles. They did not remember your many kindnesses. <laughs> Those guys rebelled uh, near the Red Sea. In other words, David remembers something. In the Exodus story, we haven't told the entire story, all the people that God was so kind to, all the people for whom God's plan worked out well, they weren't helping out God. In the story, God just defeats the emperor of Egypt. He rescues his people. He took them out of slavery, and they, they didn't even help. They forgot about God. They, they didn't think about God's miracles or kindness. They didn't obey God. They disobeyed God. And I imagine it sounds something like this, like in Exodus, we don't, we don't have any food, we don't know your plan, God, we're not going to trust you, like this seems like a mess, we're going to take matters into our own hands, forget about this whole God thing, would be the people in Exodus. This happens. When we think it's all up to us, it messes us up, and we mess things up. Like, here's a theological fact. We are not, none of us, none of us are physically capable of bearing the weight of the world on our shoulders. We we, we can't mentally imagine having the whole world in our hands. And when we think we can and when we try, it messes us up. It messes up our mental health and it messes up the people around us. Now, this is not a talk about the Ten Commandments, but... A part of the Ten Commandments, the way it's structured, is that when you don't obey the first couple, when you don't worship God, you disobey the rest. When you go, God, I really don't think you're big enough to hold the whole world in your hand. I got to grab some of that back. That's, That's desperation. That's why people lie. That's why people steal. That's why people disobey good authority. That's why people murder because they can't let go of the control that they think they have when they do their own thing because they forget about providence. Now, if you really believe that God was in control and he will make things right, he'll take care of you if you really believe that God can make good things out of bad circumstances, it would change how you live. But that's not the point of the psalm. The point of the psalm is that even though people sinned, God still did his good plan that you cannot hold back what God is doing. In the story, God's people rebelled. They started playing for the other team, and it didn't affect God's plan at all. You can't hold back God's plans for you. That's the next verse. And yet, despite all that, God saved them for his namesake to make his mighty power known God. God did what God did. He rebuked the Red Sea. He led them through a desert. He saved them from the hand of the foe and from the hand of the enemy. He redeemed them. This is King David. 400 years after the Exodus, do you see what he's doing? He's remembering the Exodus story. It's a crazy thing to think about. God's people, this is a Strange point, God's people fought against him, and God just saved them anyway. Another theological point, God doesn't save you because of what you do or who you are. You are who you are because God loves you. It's not not the other way around. And not even ourselves can stand in the way of God doing good things for us. that's, That's just a small slice of the pie of how big God is. God doesn't need our cooperation God is sovereign. We're just at our best when we're thankful for that in providence. That's King David. Uh, uh, Another little point. Um, I'll tell you another story. In fact, if you had to pick the worst moments in the whole Bible, the times when God's people thought they were lost, if you had to pick a time in the entire story of the Bible, the darkest moments would be something called the exile. What happened was that foreign enemies 
took over the kingdom of Israel. God's people were defeated. The Babylonian Empire knocked down cities, knocked down walls, killed people. The temple of God was flattened. And if there was ever a time where it looked like God was not in control, it was then. And I don't want to go too far into the details, but this is like the worst stories you can imagine. There's corruption, there's abuse. Anything, anyone looking in would go, evil is winning. People are stressed out, they're exhausted, they're paralyzed by fear and uncertainty because no one could possibly picture how God could possibly make anything good out of a season in history that looked this bad. I'm not going to tell you how bad the exile was, but what I do want to tell you is what the prophet Isaiah said that helped them. So Isaiah 63 Isaiah says, and then, if you want the context, then is after seeing how broken everything is and how you just can't see how anything is going to get any better. Isaiah says, then people, God's people recalled. They remembered the days of old, the days of Moses and his people, the Exodus. And there was a series of rhetorical questions. Where is he who brought them through the sea, the shepherd of his flock. Like, do you remember when God's people felt lost and they had no idea where, where they're going until they realized God was leading them? Where is he who set his Holy Spirit among them? In other words, remember back then when they didn't know what they were doing and then now it seems so obvious that God was giving them wisdom the whole time? Who sends his glorious arm of power to be Moses' right hand, who divided the waters before them, who gained for himself everlasting renown, who led them through the depths like an open horse in the country. They did not stumble like cattle who goes down to the plain. I, I'm not going to go through all these metaphors, but these are all really good uh, protective images of people who thought they were lost, but God was protecting them the whole time. Then Isaiah says, and they... We're given rest by the Spirit of the Lord. They who are restless. Think about it. People whose fears, that uncertainty, kept them up at night. They found rest in the Lord. Isaiah says, you know, back then people who had no hope were delivered by God. People like us who could not imagine a good outcome in God's plan. And here's the last line that I'll read. This is how you, God, guided your people to make for yourself a glorious name. It's amazing. In other words, what Isaiah is doing is when you remember God's faithfulness to people in the past, specifically in the Exodus, when you remember and see how God has kept his promises back then, it gives you better mental health, more confidence. It helps you to face whatever's next, even if you never get to see the big picture. You know, here's the thing. We all sometimes forget important things. When the cloud of the news, when whatever you encounter this week, when your disappointment is too big a burden to bear, the thing the Bible gives you that changes your life It's really simply to remember what God has done for you and what God has done for others. There's a major theme in the Bible. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, basically Moses gives a long sermon, and the theme of the sermon is remember, teach your kids, don't let anyone forget. And then they go across the Jordan River to the promised land. The very first thing they do is they put up a big stack of rock, and and God says, basically, I'm not going to read the passage, but when your kids, when anyone's kids ask, why is there a giant stack of rocks, Dad? Tell them what God did. God makes an assumption about people, and he's right. People forget important things, and it's really bad to forget important things. What will help you is to remember what God has done for you. It's a really powerful act. Remembering God's faithfulness, his power in the past can give you what you need to face whatever's next. 
thinking about God's faithfulness in the past can protect you from your own tendency to try and put the weight of the world on your shoulders. God is big enough to have the whole world in his hands. He's done it in the past, and he continues doing it. And when you can't see providence, remember how he's provided. This is huge. You would be more emotionally at peace. You would be more confident in doing what you can do and what God's called you to do. You would be uh, more faithful to what God's called you to do if you remember the past. Sidebar, um, this is actually one of the big advantages to being a part of an intergenerational church. Younger folks, you can look around. There are people worshiping with you who have seen a little bit more life than you have, and you can learn from them. Older folks, you are rich in experience. A lot of us would benefit from your experience. I'll never forget, I've told this story a bunch, but it's really hit me. I, I remember visiting one of my favorite people, Ewald Dykeshorn, and we sat down next to his warm wood stove, and he talked about he was praying for us, and he was praying for a church, and he was really interested in hearing about catechism and kids' church and younger folks. And I said something, and Ewald, it's, it's, you know, it's really hard to be a young person these days. And I said something like, you know, a lot of kids are struggling with anxiety. They're getting bullied on social media. I said something like that. And Ewald, genuinely concerned, like really cared. I can't imitate his accent, but he said, you know, social media, whatever that is, <laughs> I don't think he knew, it sounds really hard. It was so much easier when I was a child. And he told me about his simple childhood. He was a preteen when Hitler's army invaded his village in Holland, killed a bunch of people. And as a preteen, instead of being on Facebook, he was uh, constricted, const he was whatever. They forced him to work in like a Nazi food factory. His job was to distribute food. And it was a lot of pressure because. If he gave out too much food to somebody, the commander in charge assumed the family was hiding Jewish refugees, and they'd go and arrest people, and people would get really hurt. And with no sense of irony, my paraphrase, Ewad goes, man, being a young person was, sounds really hard now. It's so good we didn't have social media back then, because, you know, I was okay. <laughs> and, uh, I left the conversation. I, I couldn't really help laughing about it a little bit, because... I think that whatever I'm worried about is probably not that bad. <laughs> and, uh, God has been so faithful to so many people through so much, and I, I think we're going to survive social media. <laughs> and uh, he talked about God's providence and how God just brought him all over the earth in just good times and awful times. And uh, I, I learned that we just forget so much. I'm really convinced that our collective memory Remembering what God's brought us through helps us. This just isn't a, you know, social idea, I guess. There's an empty cross behind me. You know why the cross is there? Because you need to remember that God is big enough to bring good from evil, even when the evil is as traumatic as the unjust torture and murder of God's Son, and the good is as unlikely as a resurrection from the good. Of course, it's Memorial Day weekend. It's a holiday literally designed to remember things, right? In the case of this weekend, tomorrow especially, is to remember that there were people who believed so strongly that there was more to this life than their own, that they gave it all for the benefit of others, people like us. We would be better off to remember this. I also spent some brief moments this week with one of our members, Harry Gross. I think Harry's watching. <laughs> Hello, Harry. Harry has severe heart congestive failure right now. And he's sitting on his couch, ready and waiting to go to heaven. And I sat with him this week, and I, I, I talked a little bit. I read scripture, and I prayed with him. But mostly I listened. You know what Harry talked about? Harry remembered and he talked about sitting in this church. He talked about standing here for his profession of faith class. He talked about the members standing next to him in that moment. 
He remembered pastors who long since passed away. He talked about his peers who have passed. He talked about people like Jant of Rees and Agnet Yeomans. And he talked about walking around that graveyard where so many of our faithful members are buried. He talked about stopping by the gravestones and leaving flowers of people who have gone by before him. He remembered. And I think he brought all that up because remembering gave him comfort. The comfort from knowing that since God has been faithful through a long life to so many people in the past, remembering God's faithfulness gives confidence that whatever's ahead of him, no matter what ahead was ahead of us, God will stay consistently faithful. One of our problems is that we forget important things. But if you could remember God's faithfulness in the past, if you could remember providence, this would help you navigate uncertain seasons where you don't know what's ahead of you. Remembering might help you. So Father in heaven, right now I pray that you would just come to us. Father, you the source of every, of every blessing, of every foundation, all that we can stand on ultimately comes from you. And can you remind us of that and give us hope as we remember your faithfulness in the past, remind us of the future. And can you just come to us, you, the source of every blessing, remind us of who you are and how you will continue to bless us and keep us safe. I ask this in the name of Jesus, amen.